Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the uh, German Erasmus Academy German course, uh, the packaged version. Um, I'm recording today with uh, Sierra. Sierra is going to be our guide throughout this course through the uh, 30 chapters of the textbook and into the uh, further text that we'll be reading. Uh, Sierra, you want to say hello? Hello, everyone. Welcome. <laughs> Great. So we're recording in two different places. I'm, I'm uh, recording from the Erasmus Academy studio in Brooklyn, New York. And Sierra, you are? I am in Northern California. Yeah. So we're recording uh, this uh, kind of live, obviously. And uh, so this um, course uh, replicates the summer intensive course uh, in which uh, an entire first year of college language instruction is is uh, given. So it, it begins from the very beginning, from scratch. And by the end of the eight weeks, normally during the summer intensive, uh, students would be in a position to read scholarly, scholarly texts in the language or to enter a second year uh, college German course. And so um, it covers everything, all the grammar. And it's quite different from uh, what you might find otherwise online that would help you learn to speak the language, to be able to converse uh, with a few sentences if you go overseas or if you talk, or if you go into a restaurant or that sort of thing. So this gives you the, the full foundation of the grammar. And um, <clears throat> so it will uh, present the grammar of one chapter and then, then give examples through the various um, sentences that, that, that exemplify the grammar that's presented. Um, and you'll see it, it's quite a complete course. And there are a lot of options in learning German, um, of course, online. But I, I think the one where you actually learn the reason for which um, uh, to understand the grammar and then to apply it immediately with sentences is, is one of the best ways to do it. Our focus is on reading and translation. And, and um, this is the uh, home page of the Erasmus Academy. We offer uh, summer intensive courses um, eight during the summer altogether. And, um, and so, so this course is based on that uh, intensive course, but it's obviously um, a, a packaged course. So you, you can do it on your own time and, and at your own schedule and at your own leisure. So uh, I'm just gonna turn on the webcams uh, so you can see who your uh, uh, guides will be through the course. Um, hello everybody, this is, uh, I'm Ron Dittmars and, and this is uh, Sierra. Um, and we are recording in two different places, as, as we mentioned to you. So um, uh, let me give you a little bit of history of the, of the Erasmus Academy, a little bit of background, and then we'll give a little bit of our, our own sort of uh, backgrounds and something of, of our, uh, how we came to be uh, uh, teaching German and, and guiding you through this course. So um, the Erasmus Academy started in, in the, at Union Seminary in New York City. Um, probably uh, about 25 years ago, in fact. So this is the 25th year of, of teaching languages uh, nice. online, which is a very long time. Uh, so we know all the tricks of the trade. <laughs> so um, anyway, it started in Union Seminary, which is across from Clum University. And uh, they, I was in the doctoral program there, and they offered just Biblical Hebrew and New Testament Greek. And so I proposed adding uh, some of the modern research languages like French, German, and Spanish, and then eventually Latin. Uh, so we taught in the, we, we've ended up developing a course there, uh, teaching in the classroom setting, and probably 80 or 90 percent of the students uh, were from Clum University, Fordham University, uh, NYU, and then the, the, the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. So we had quite a broad uh, spectrum of, of students from various fields like like history, art history, archaeology, uh, international studies, uh, history, f philosophy, um, uh, classics, a lot of very bright students, uh, which, which is always uh, a lot of fun to teach students who are, who are motivated and, and have lots of energy. So uh, we ha I had around 15 students in each summer and, and, uh, and then directed the summer language program for those eight or nine years. And then after finishing from the seminary, then I went into um, we then started to, to switch to an online platform. So that's a little bit about the background of the Erasmus Academy. Uh, this past summer, we had a record enrollment of 94 enrollees in eight different in these eight different language courses. And each of the teachers uh, lives in a different part of the country and we teach online in real time. So people log on at specific times 
and interact directly with the instructors and other classmates and can be heard and 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 and, and uh, participate in the classes that way. So uh, before going on further, um, Sierra, would you like to introduce yourself and, and tell us uh, briefly how you came to find out about this uh, course that you became involved in? Sure, yes, I was uh, looking at graduate programs. Um, my background is in history, mostly ancient history. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kind of had a broader focus, or not much of a focus. It was really broad when I began my research into graduate school. And I um, had taught yoga for many years. So I was very interested in ancient Indian culture. And, and so I was looking for a Sanskrit class to be able to read um, and understand more about the culture of ancient India. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I found Erasmus Academy as one of the very few um, online Sanskrit courses that they offer. It's one of the languages they offer during the summer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was excited to take that one, but it was at that time, it was already in August and the course had finished. Um, so I looked at any other offerings that they had during the year that I could possibly take. And I stumbled upon this um, two-semester German for reading knowledge class. And mm -hmm. knowing that um, I need to have a proficiency in German to obtain a PhD as one of the mm -hmm. requirements yeah. for my area of, of history. Uh, and I had taken German as an undergrad. And so I just wanted to get my proficiency level up to the point where I could, you know, pass the exam without much stress. And... Uh, so I decided to enroll into that class, and then Ron and I, you know, decided to record them, and it ended up being a nice um, opportunity to package the course. And so we've had a lot of fun over the past year recording uh, the classes, and it's been a really great experience for me, and I feel very confident now. Um, with my level of German mm -hmm. and um, feel very confident going into a proficiency exam knowing that I have the basics of grammar and sentence structure and I can recognize, um, you know, certain nuances of the grammar and, you know, just a couple of vocabulary words that I have to look up. But we do so much of an extensive vocabulary with some of the additional uh, materials for the course. Mm -hmm. It really helps getting a, just a background basis of certain words and understanding when they're just a compound word or they just have an ending but you kind of know the root word and so it really makes that you not I, I feel like I don't have to rely too heavily on a dictionary to be able to understand the context and mm -hmm. um, so I feel very confident about that now at some point you get to you get to, um, to a point where the further you, the more you read the, the more vocabulary you learn by osmosis and by context as opposed to taking time to look up the word in the in the dictionary, which is a nice right, point yeah. to reach. So the course that um, Sierra was referring to was, uh, I was planning to do a year long uh, uh, course in German, which would be the same content exactly as the summer intensive, but spread over five or six months. Uh, there were four or five people enrolled in that and that was fine. And then finally those four other dropped out and Sierra said, no, I'd like to do the course. So I thought, well, this is an opportune uh, time to maybe do a recording because you don't want to do a recording with, uh, say, 15 people on on uh, also uh, in the in the course who are speaking and moving around and making noise and disrupting and or, I don't mean disrupting, but but just um, um, when they're when they're um, muting themselves or muting out or whatever you hear dogs barking in the background that sort of thing <laughs> i don't mind dogs at all but but anyway it would it would just be much more um a much better option to do a recording with one person directly and so we recorded through the all the we recorded all 30 chapters and we're going to give you we're going to actually go through the chapter one tonight or today and um <clears throat> and so it turned out really well as as she mentioned as uh, sierra mentioned um, and uh, so that w was really good. Just a little bit on my own background. I went to Kenyon College in Ohio, and then I traveled for two and a half years through Europe, Africa, and Asia as a freelance writer, taking odd jobs wherever I could find them, and and really uh, found, uh, lived in different cultures and really had a wonderful experience. That we have a common. We we both have been to India, although she's been done much more extensive research and understands the tradition much more much better than I do. But um, so then I came back and and I wanted to do research languages on a more a more serious level. 
So I then applied to uh, German universities with the intention of, of learning uh, German and, and Latin, and then returning to the United States to start a, a doctoral program in comparative literature at that point. But uh, when I got to Germany, I fell in love with the language and the culture. I sang in a Bach choir for two years, which was probably the best experience of my life. And then I played on the basketball team for a couple of years and, and coached tennis to, to earn my room and board. Um, but I was there for six years. Um, maybe, a, uh, maybe, um, um, maybe good news to you that I actually failed my language examination when I first took it. I knew I was going to fail the, the language admittance examination in German because I'd only studied two or three weeks. But then, um, and you have to be able to pass the exam at the beginning of the next semester in order to remain matriculated, which is a great stimulus, of course. And so then I, for those six years, I did nothing but speak and read and write German for the whole time. And I wrote a, uh, a, a not a dissertation, but a Magisterarbeit on Goethe's journey through Italy and his his um, uh, encounter with the Last Supper painting of Leonardo da Vinci, which which referred to all of his encounters with other um, art uh, artists in Italy and and the whole Renaissance uh, experience that he that he um, had a chance to be exposed to. Anyway, that's um, uh, but then um, when I came back when I um, came back from studying in Europe, then I went to uh, eventually went to Princeton Seminary where I did three years of uh, an MDiv degree, and I started I started tutoring uh, German at that point, right at the beginning, and also some Latin, um, and then um, and, and then I went uh, into parish ministry for six years, and then started the doctoral program at Union Seminary, which which was then the beginning of this Erasmus Academy, because I love languages so much and wanted to help people uh, get an get an edge and and be inspired by the language too. So. So what what we what we do in the course is um, we really have fun with the language. Uh, there's, you'll see there's a banner back and forth between Sierra and myself as we go through some of the sentences or make jokes about them or, or whatever, and maybe her dog will bark in the background <laughs> occasionally, um, which is which is nice. Um, but you don't hear the clatter of 15 people in the background, which is obviously uh, distracting. So um, that's a kind of a brief overview. Um, Sarah, you want to add anything yourself? Um, that you might have thought about when I was um, mentioning a few things. Um, no, just um, once we go over the materials, we can I can kind of throw in some comments there because the I think the array of different materials that Ron has selected for the course really give you a really nice um, understanding. Like I mentioned, the vocabulary, but also reading and different mm -hmm. different areas of literary, historical scientific and um, you know maybe comparative literature as well and then there's a one text we use that's real nice that gives you a little bit more idiomatic and collo colloquial uh, German mm -hmm. and uh, so that one's kind of fun and and has some funny stories and um, mm -hmm. so yeah it, it turns out to be a, a lot of fun and um, I'm you know I'm really excited to be part of this project and present this to you. Great, great. Okay, fantastic. So let's go back to the screen, and I'm just going to, um, and we'll pull up uh, our webcams again at the end of the lesson just to say, uh, to say goodbye until the next lesson. So let's see, I'm going to pull up the screen here and go to, um, let's see. Uh, yeah. Okay, so this is the, um, let's see, one second. Here, can you see the screen here? Um, yes. With this? Yeah, the right. syllabus, yeah. Yeah, great, okay. Okay, so, um, all right, and I see what's, so the, this is a red, red, uh, do, do you mind red for the beginning of this? Can you see the red on the screen? <laughs> yeah, I can see it. Okay, okay, so this is the packaged version, and uh, what I'm going to do, this is the assignment for the first chapter, and it, it gives uh, assignments in each of the different resources, and this is a way by which I will introduce the different um, uh, resources for the course. Um, we'll start off with the German alphabet and pronunciation, of course. Uh, now, at the beginning of each of each of these recordings, and there's one recording for each chapter, so we call lesson one, it's based on Yannick chapter one, very logical and simple. <clears throat> um, so you have a, a grammar introduction. So uh, the as you're uh, going through this course, you should really, and, and there's there will be uh, instructions as to 
exactly how you should proceed to benefit the most from this course. Um, and uh, as, as we mentioned before, this is uh, primarily uh, reading and translation exercises to learn the grammar of the, of the language. And uh, we'll talk a little bit later about supplementing that with some conversational tapes that would really uh, supplement this uh, course really well and, and enable you to, to be active, actively understanding the language. Anyway, so um, what you should do is read the, the grammar first of the chapter, and we use the fifth edition. Ideally, you can get the sixth edition if you want to. It's practically the same. And this will be um, somewhat like um, maybe 10 or 15 minutes uh, going through the grammar of the chapter and, and introducing the most salient uh, uh, um, parts of the, of the presentation. And uh, we're obviously starting with chapter one today. And then uh, then we'll go uh, do some vocabulary study. And, and each of these chapters also has a uh, Grun Wortschatz, which is which is the um, vocabulary that is presented in those chapters, and you are responsible for learning those. And they're very uh, fundamental words, um, um, highly frequently frequently occurring words. And then we have two um, vocabulary study resources. One is called the Hundred Important Stems, and the assignment for the first lesson is to learn the the, the words and the and words that are related to the first word. Um, uh, in uh, numbers one through four, so um, and this we learn in word family. So if, if you as you learn one word, if you if you happen to word, learn another word and, and another word that are that are related to it all in separate times, then it's much more difficult to keep in your mind. But if you learn the one root word and then the four or five words that are that are connected to it, that are related to it etymologically, then it's much easier to learn this whole group as a family unit. And then uh, you you can connect back to the basic meaning of the word, and it's it probably helps um, by uh, at least 50 or 100 percent of of uh, learning vocabulary. Then a second uh, resource that we use um, on a e during each lesson is called Easy Key to German Vocabulary, and this is really a genial work. Um, it has uh, three columns, as you will see, uh, the German word, the basic meaning, and then and then English cognates or or anything etymologically connected uh, that, that German has in relationship to uh, English. Okay, then then um, going down to the, let me just erase this, uh, going down to the, uh, the further uh, assignment sheet. Uh, in the 1980 edition, this is a, um, a very, uh, let me just get that, grab the pen here. So this is a, a this, this uh, 1980 edition, um, has uh, also exercise sentences and following paragraphs, but uh, this is a self, um, uh, s sort of like a self tutorial uh, um, practice in in the grammar of, the, of this chapter, and uh, every sentence in the in in the textbook, every sentence in every chapter, is read by a native German speaker, Aneta, who was my um, who's my assistant teacher when I was teaching it in New York City. And she reads every sentence uh, in German. And then for each sentence, I point out any new grammatical element that happens to be present in that sentence, and then give you a literal translation so that you can work through all of these sentences and then, um, and then check your translations or, or notice anything grammatically that's interesting or different. Uh, and then also check your translations for accuracy. And then we will, you'll see we have a fourth stage there in which you actually will translate those, your, your now corrected English translation, uh, and then reverse translate that back into the target language, back into German. And, and that, uh, you will see, uh, improves your reading skills more than anything else. Um, Sierra, you want to say anything about that, um, about uh, that sort of process? Uh, yeah, I think it's... Um immensely helpful to be able to reverse translate uh, from English into German because you know the majority of the class is the opposite is, is translating and working with the German um, to find the English meaning and so it's it's really nice to train your brain as well to start to think about how you would how would you express yourself mm -hmm. or write in German um, using you know the correct grammar and syntax and everything like that and so it, it really helps um, gain a, a much more full understanding of German I think by doing that and then being able to 
hear Aneta and her, and you know, and hear another person pronouncing the words uh, mm -hmm. is always helpful mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So a, a lot of the intensive courses, um, so-called rapid reading courses, will just have uh, will consist primarily in just translating from German into English. But our course um, has as a very important constituent the the translating from English back into German. And there's nothing like that for uh, for increasing your reading skills and, and and also understanding of the language. If you can formulate German and you know express express in German your thoughts uh, as you develop skills in the language. So you'll find that a lot of fun. We have lots of exercises related to that, as you'll see. So in these sentences, which are a little bit more easier, sometimes the grammar of that that's presented in each chapter in the respective chapters uh, becomes more transparent or more easily transparent. And then, then you would switch to the fifth edition and sometimes the sentences are repeated, but we never repeat, of course, the same exercise sentences. As you'll see, there, there are some gaps here in the sentences and the exercise sentences uh, written here, two to seven, 10 to 14. So that's so eight, nine, eight and nine were actually repeat sentences from the earlier edition, etc. And then you have the final paragraph uh, to translate as well. Um, so we go through that, um, and 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 these. Um, so so this is um, you have the MP3 recordings. Uh, so this is an entirely self uh, self correcting system here, a very very much a programmatic learning system. And this, when we get to the fifth edition, um, you'll listen to the recordings that we're making now. Uh, and you'll listen to how we analyze and translate these sentences and also the final paragraph. So this is the recording where you have its answer key, so to speak. Then we go to, um, let's see, um, then we go down to the uh, workbook um, and um, <clears throat> the workbook itself uh, is, is what um, Sierra was mentioning earlier. It's called the Griesbach, uh, another name for it. And it has, um, again, a presentation of the grammar and you learn it in different ways but it's a much more conversational uh, text um, and uh, and anecdotal and very interesting and funny stories that <laughs> as you mentioned um, Sierra um, and that that will reinforce what we're learning in the Yannick textbook and 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 these will have also an answer key a written answer key so that you can uh, correct for for accuracy there and then the final um, uh, uh, final element in the in the assignment or in the work for one chapter is a composition and these are um, these are maybe 10 to 15 sentences uh, in English that you translate uh, back into German and 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 these will be um, <clears throat> these will probably be included in the in the recordings but if not then there would be an answer key provided for that as well so um, let's see anything you want to say about the workbook you want to add to that um, Sierra uh, no, it's just it's just a nice way um, to work through the language as well, and it presents, you know, the grammar, but sometimes in a different way or form or with pictures, really really funny drawings and stuff. And so mm -hmm. it's just kind of a little bit more lighthearted and um, fun way. It has a lot of exercises that are really useful to get more practice uh, using. Um, parts of the language like the pronouns or prepositions or mm -hmm. conjugating the verbs and a lot more um, specific highlighting those those aspects whereas you know the, the textbook just kind of presents the grammar and then you have sentences to translate but doesn't necessarily give you a, a ton of practice on working with a specific aspect of the grammar mm -hmm. and so I think it's really Great. nice that the workbook does that and um, and gives you more practice in general. Great. Okay. Yeah, you, people will find find that uh, working through these exercises uh, on a regular and consistent basis really helps with writing German because you know you you have problem with prepositions, uh, the the gender of nouns, and all that's that's important to note. And and this gives you a lot of really great practice overall. Okay. So let's see. I'm going to go now to um, a. Uh, can you see this on the screen now? The the Indo-European. Family of languages. Yes, I can. Great. Uh -huh. Let me see if I yeah. can increase it a little bit. Okay. So, um, all right. So, uh, this is uh, very helpful to think about uh, where German fits in this larger system. Let me see if I can uh, get our nice color again, red. 
Uh, I normally would use orange or green or light blue, but it's fun to vary, uh, to mix it up a bit. So you're probably familiar with the Indo-European family of languages. The main ones are Albanian, Baltic, along this line here, Slavic, Celtic, uh, Armenian, Germanic, Latin, Greek, uh, Iranian, and Indic, uh, related to Sanskrit. So, uh, and where's uh, English um, in this whole group? English is down at the bottom, right in the middle. Okay, right here. So, um, not a very good circle here. So, English is, um, you can see, um, is really has two lines of influence, two streams of where vocabulary and, and, and language have come in to influence it. One is the uh, Germanic and the other is the Latin, uh, largely via French. But um, English is really technically a Germanic language because the further you go back in the history of the English language, the more and more it approximates German. So if you go back to, say, uh, Middle English like uh, Chaucer, that's not too hard really for us to read and to understand, uh, say, you know, 12th, 13th century. Uh, but if you go back to Beowulf, which is uh, early English, then uh, that's like 9th, 10th century. That's really almost impossible for English readers and, and uh, uh, English speaking people to, to read and understand. But Germans can actually read it and understand it better. So the further you go back in the history of the English language, the more and more it approximates German and the more, and the more um, German words it has, which is kind of interesting because uh, I always say learning German is, is really like doing uh, excavation, an archaeological excavation with the English language, because you're starting to uncover some phases or stages of the language that, that, are, that, that are the precedent that, that uh, lead up to the present day English. And you really learn a lot of the roots and fundamental meanings of words that, that might not have occurred to you, which we do all the time. It happens all the time. So there's actually about 35% um, uh, of the words currently uh, um, Thirty-five percent of the, all the words we use in English come from the German side, and sixty-five or sixty percent of the words come from the Latin-based side. Uh, earlier, it was it was a larger percentage. If say you go back to the twelfth century, maybe it was like fifty percent of the words were from the uh, Germanic side, and 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 you know fifty or forty-five from the Latin. But Latin began to influence very early on, began to influence English very early on with Caesar's invasion of Britain back in the first century. Um, okay, so, um, and, and I would say, since these are the two major uh, families of languages which influence English, if you really want to, I, I always try to encourage, say, young scholars or, or anyone who really wants to learn English really well to, <clears throat> to have some experience with these two uh, larger families of languages which have been uh, primarily influential in forming uh, English. So I'm going to turn now to a... Um, a more uh, detailed chart. Let's see, one second here. And uh, that's... Uh, let's see here. Oh yeah, okay, okay, here we go. All right, so here we go. Um, this is the Proto-Indo-European chart. And this is a, a, obviously a much more detailed uh, chart that you can see, uh, which um, sort of talks about the, the same so, s sort of, uh, it's the same subject, obviously. And here you have the Germanic family right here, and then here the Italic family, the Latin family right down here. Okay, so you can see Germanic has several branches, the North Germanic, the West Germanic, and English happens to be right here. I can't enlarge it large enough but to, to make this out easily, but this is English, Middle English, and Old English, going back to the West Germanic branch which together, which includes also Frisian or Dutch or Middle Dutch, or and then um, some of these other languages. Um, the uh, Northern Germanic uh, section or, or branch of this larger family are uh, included, Are some of those are the uh, Scandinavian languages like Swedish, Danish, and um, <coughs> um, uh, uh, Nor Norwegian, not Finnish, of course. I went to Finland and have no clue what's, what, what they're speaking there. That's part of the <laughs> Hungarian, um, Uric Hungarian uh, family of languages, which is entirely outside of this whole Indo-European system, by the way. So, Correct, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if you, have you had any chance or, or heard anyone speaking um, um, Finnish? Uh, no, sorry. but I, I have studied a lot of the, the Proto-Indo-European languages and 
you know, uh, language roots. And mm -hmm. um, it is interesting the the few languages that are outside of this that that still exist today, like Basque and, mm -hmm. as you said, Finnish, and Hungarian. And yeah. yeah. So here you see uh, the, the Italic or the Latin uh, family and, and all the uh, Romance languages, obviously, uh, Portuguese, Spanish, um, uh, Provençal, French, uh, retro romanish in Switzerland, Romanian, and Italian, etc. Okay, so you got sort of a general idea. So, um, the, so German would would give you some key if you were to learn, a, say, a, if at some time, some some point in your lifetime, you wanted to learn uh, uh, Danish or you wanted to learn um, uh, Norwegian, you'd have a really a good foundation. In the vocabulary, I, I can look at texts from those languages and I can make them out. I can't speak them, but I can make out a lot of the vocabulary. And same thing with Italian. If you learn, if you learn Latin, you can you know make out probably 50 or 60 percent of all the words in these in these um, <clears throat> derivative languages, modern languages. There. Okay. I have a funny story about that, Ron. Yeah, when yeah, I ahead. was in um, when I was in northern Spain, up in a Barcelona region, they speak Catalan, and oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And my Spanish, my Castilian Spanish isn't very strong, but I was able to read a lot of the street signs and understand the people because of my Latin experience and Latin being, you know, Catalan being one of the languages, whereas Spanish actually has 25% of the Spanish language influenced by Arabic hmm. when the Moors were in Spain. And so they, you know, so it has a little heavier influence of uh, Arabic and Spanish versus Catalan, which is actually a little bit closer to Latin. Mm -hmm. Wow. So it's just wow. kind of fun to just, you know, like you said, being able to see a related language or a daughter language and be able to recognize vocabulary and, and uh, from having studied the parent language. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, so um, great. Now, um, let's see. We're going to take a look at a little sample of, of, of uh, reading German a, a little bit before we even look at the vocabulary. Let's see here. Hold on a second. Um, okay, let's see. Um, go back. Okay, let's see. All right, here we go. All right, uh, this is just for uh, practice. This is kind of an old, older, older map, as you can see. Um, and uh, we're just going to practice uh, some of the um, speaking, some of the, the names of the countries. And then there's a small little text there that we'll go through just for the fun of it before we actually pre present the pronunciation of the letters and so on. So just get a, a little feel for it first. So um, let's see if I can get the screen again, the pen. So here we go. Uh, let's just read some of these out loud. And, and by the way, um, whenever I uh, read a sentence or a paragraph, then Sierra will repeat it after me, and that's the time for you to you who are listening to this and taking this course should repeat with her. In other words, um, to get a sense of the of the sound of the words, how to pronounce them, sort of the flow of the sentences and that sort of thing. So um, I always uh, Sierra will repeat after me, and then please read with her if you can. Okay, here we go. Norwegian. Norwegian. Sweden. Sweden, England, England, Frankreich, Frankreich, Spanien, Spanien, Die Schweiz, Die Schweiz, Polen, Polen, Deutschland, Deutschland, Ungarn, Ungarn, Where's, what's Ungarn? Ungarn is Hungary, good, Italian, Italian, Griechenland, Griechenland. Die Türkei. Die Türkei. Okay, and then uh, Irland. Irland. And here's uh, Holland. Holland. Und Dänemark. Dänemark. Good. Okay. Great. Um, all right. Now let's take a look at this. Uh, this little. This is uh, the Landkarte, the 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 land map, or the or the country map, and uh, and. There, this is a very simple sentence. This, this is the very beginning, the very first paragraph in that marvelous workbook that you're going to just love, <laughs> um, that, that is, makes such a hit with uh, Sierra. And uh, there are just a few words that you may not recognize. Uh, ist is very, let me see if I can get the marker here. Um, 
Okay, so is just means is. And the word uh, legan or um, leaked comes from our, our English word lie, where it lies, it is located. This means it is located. And legan is the plural, so they are located. So this is third person singular, um, first person plural, uh, third person plural, they they are located, etc. And then th th that's the only verb in this whole <laughs> this whole paragraph. Uh, Carta is a, is a map, you can imagine that. Ina is just a, like in uh, indefinite prone, um, indefinite article. And so, uh, so I'm going to read some of this, and then again, uh, Sierra will repeat after me, and please read with her. That would be really great to get a feel for the language initially. So here we go. Here is eine Karte, everybody. Here is eine Karte. Das ist eine Landkarte von Europa. Das ist eine Landkarte von Europa. Notice the U R is pronounced like as if it were O Y, like boy, Europa. Here is Deutschland. Here is Deutschland. The EU has a similar sound like oi, Deutschland. Und dort ist Frankreich. Und dort ist Frankreich. Notice a little bit of a guttural here, which we'll go into. Frankreich liegt in Westeuropa und Deutschland liegt in Mitteleuropa. Everybody? Frankreich liegt in Westeuropa und Deutschland liegt in Mitteleuropa. Great. Here is Russland. Russland liegt in Osteuropa. Here is Russland. Russland liegt in Ost Europa. Schweden und Norwegen liegen in Nordeuropa. Schweden und Norwegen liegen in Nordeuropa. So you could probably make out the meaning of this. You want to just translate these slowly so we can follow? Sure. Here is a map. Mm -hmm. uh, that or this or it is a map of Europe. Mm -hmm. Here is Germany, and there is France. Yeah, go ahead. France, France lies in West Europe, and Germany lies in Middle Europe. Okay, I forgot to mention this. Dort means there, which uh, which isn't obvious there. And then uh, leaked is we we've had already. Okay, um, going on from here is Russland. Here is Russia. Russia lies in East Europe. Sweden and Norway lie in North Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, Spain, Italy, and Greece lie in South Europe. Great. Okay. Fantastic. Um, let's go down to uh, some of these questions here, where you just reverse the verb and the subject to make a question like in English. Liegt Frankreich in Südeuropa, everybody? Liegt Frankreich in Südeuropa? Liegt Italien in Nordeuropa? Liegt Italien in Nordeuropa? Wo liegen Spanien und Griechenland? Wo liegen Spanien und Griechenland? Berlin liegt in Deutschland. Berlin liegt in Deutschland. Wo liegt Paris? Wo liegt London? Wo liegt Rom? Wo liegt Paris? Wo liegt London? Wo liegt Rom? Uh, let's do a couple more of these. Um, Japan. Notice the J is pronounced like a Y, which we'll get into in a second. Japan, Indian, and Pakistan liegen in Asien. Japan, Indian, and Pakistan liegen in Asien. Ägypten liegt in Afrika. Ägypten liegt in Afrika. Okay, here's our uh, Finland, our beloved country. Uh, wo liegt Finland? Belgien, Morocco, China. That ch is like a guttural in the beginning. China, Brazilian. Just do that sentence. Wo liegt Finland, Belgien, Morocco, China, Brazilian? So uh, you want to translate from here, just down to say a couple lines down, down to Sud Europa. Sure. Uh, does Denmark lie in North Europe? Mm -hmm. Yes, Denmark lies in North Europe. Does Portugal also lie in North Europe? No, Portugal lies not in North Europe. Rather in South Europe. Okay, then how about uh, Vaux Paris? Uh, where lies Paris? Where lies London? Where lies Rome? Mm -hmm. And this last little sentence here. Uh, Japan, India, and Pakistan lie in Asia. Good. Okay. Um, great. <clears throat> so uh, let's see. So that's a little bit of practice. Now we're going to um, from here. We're just going to go and 
and uh, start with the, with the pronunciation uh, of the language. And I have a couple of sheets that we'll use for that. And uh, but we'll take a, a, just a mini mini break, and we'll uh, come right back. Okay. So um, going on here with the um, the German alphabet, you can see on the screen. Uh, can you see that, uh, Sierra? Yes. Okay, great. Um, and this will give us our nice red color. Okay, so this is the German alphabet. You see here, um, <clears throat> um, the actually the Fraktur script, the earlier script that the language was written in, um, in the up even to the middle of the 19th century and some into the 20th century, we don't learn this script, but it's it's fairly easy to recognize, and uh, it's good to, to be able to know um, this script um, if, if you're doing any research in those centuries. But uh, this list just gives you the alphabet, and it gives you the German name of the letters, and then this is, the, the of course, the Roman uh, letters that are used today. <clears throat> so uh, some are very similar to English, and some are not. So let's just read these. A, B, C. Everybody? Ah, uh, be, say. So instead of B and C, it's be and say. This is just a, and notice that C is pronounced like a little bit like a T-S, say, say. And then uh, day, A. Day, A. F, G. F, G. Ha, E. Ha, E. Okay, so instead of I, it's E. And then this is a big one, Yot. Yot. So the J is not pronounced like a J, it's like, and everyone who says Carl Jung, you know that hasn't had any German. Um, but um, so the J is already pronounced like a Y, a big difference. Um, ka elf, sorry, ka l. Ka l. M n. M n. So you notice the pronunciation of the letters themselves sometimes are similar or sometimes slightly different. Okay, let's see here. Okay, going on. Uh, pay, ku. Pay, ku. So the Q is a little bit different sounding than the our Q. It's like just like just like it looks like here. Ku, air. Air. It takes a while to. That's nice air there. R, s t. S t. U. Ooh. And then V is always pronounced like an F. So foul. Foul. And and W conversely is pronounced like a V. 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 So you could say father, which is the word for father, uh, but you pronounce the V like a F. And then uh, water is Wasser, so you pronounce uh, W like a V, almost like the Vassar College. <laughs> um, okay, let's see here. Okay, then let me erase this. Just one second here. Okay, so um, all right. Okay, so here are the other uh, letters. If you can see that fairly well. Um, large a little bit. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, let me just large a little bit more. Okay. So um, uh, X is pronounced like X. Then Y is Upsilon. That just letter. The name of the letter is Upsilon. Kind of w funny. I uh, just pronounce those two. X, Upsilon. Said. Said. Notice the Z has a little bit T S sound there. <clears throat> then A umlaut is A. Very sharp A. A. U. U. And U. U. This is really hard to pronounce. Think think of trying to say an E. Uh, think think E. And then as you think, try to say E, purse your lips and t t just so you form a small little opening. U. U. Try that. U. 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 Good. And then uh, say ha. Say ha. These combinations are not so important uh, for the modern writing, but in the uh, Fraktur script, the earlier writing, these two letters actually occur together. So uh, say uh, say ka. Say ka. S z. S z. Not uh, most uh, computers uh, 
don't readily have this letter, but you find this in lots of words, like Strauss is still written today, but you can replace this with uh, two S's um, without, you know, and that's perfectly correct. And then te said. Uh, te said. Good, okay. Let's see here. Um, okay, see if this is the right one. There we go. Okay, so let me just enlarge this a bit. Okay, so here's here's some letters, actually with words, and we're only going to go over the ones where there's uh, quite a, a bit difference. So this is Buch, uh, and and um, it's sort of at the end of the word. It sounds like a like a like a p gelb, hopped gipsed. So uh, let's do this a uh, c. Um, sounds like a t s, like in hats, Celsius, Caesar. Celsius, Cesar. Okay. Um, C is always pronounced like a hard, hard C, like in cake, like a K. So this is Café Cranach. Café Cranach. And then the CH doesn't is the the infamous or or, or well beloved uh, um, guttural sound. So let's read some of this. Ich echt, everybody. Ich echt. Good. Uh, Nächte. Nächte. Notice the A umlaut has a sharp A, so Nächte, euch. Euch. Remember the EU has a, o, it sounds like an O-Y, I mean like a, like, like in boy, yeah, euch. Durch. Durch. Chemisch. Chemisch. With a little bit of a guttural in the beginning. And then China. China. Sort of funny sound. Okay. Um, all right. So um, it's not a liquid sound, it's like, like not... Some people say ish, but it's ich. It's a it's a silent um, sound, a little bit down in your throat, a little bit. Some people don't like the sound, say they don't like the sound of it as guttural, but it's really a subtle sound. It's not. It it can be very pleasant too. I mean, I I think it is. <laughs> um, let's see. Just one second here. Okay, so going down, and then um, so ch. No, no, nothing different here. X, Bakken, Dam, T, F. These are all very similar to English, so I'm not going to go over them. Then remember, uh, G is always hard. Gas, Regen, Rogan, K. Um, okay, then then the then the I C H um, also has no equivalent, so it's and it has a little bit of a guttural sound. So this is um, König. Try that one. König. There's an O umlaut. König. Ewig. Ewig. So the IG, as a final IG, has a little bit of a guttural sound. Uh, the second G in garage, some words have French origin. Garage, loge. And then, let's see. Um, and then Y is a big one. So, I mean, J is a big one. It sounds like Y. So this is Jung, Jahr. Jung. Yar. His last name, this actually means young, just like English. So that means this word itself comes from the German word. Any word that's similar is, is one that has its origin in German that has come into English. Um, okay, then uh, let's see. Land, man, this is very not a problem. Okay, then um, let's see here. Oh, just one second. <clears throat> okay, so let me enlarge this again. Can. Oh, let's see. Hold on. Hold on one second. Just gonna. Just. Gonna, I'm just gonna pause this for a second. We'll be right back. Okay, just uh, picking up again, sorry for the little uh, interruption. So going over with a pronunciation guide. So N sounds like, like in English, uh, NG, same, no problem. Um, then QU uh, sounds like a KV. So this is Quella, everybody? Quella. Quecksilver. Quecksilver. This happens to be source Silver. and this happens to be mercury. So mercury is quick silver basically <laughs> very little words in english uh, in german sometimes are are amusing um 
the R really has no equivalent. It's it's like a Riechen. Try that. Riechen. Riechen. Ur. Ur. It's a much softer uh, R than than the American R, like like that. Um, okay. Then you have also the S's. Uh, Wasser. Whenever you have two consonants, of course, it makes the shorter vowel a little bit. Uh, I mean, the preceding uh, vowel a little bit shorter. Now, um, Schule. Asha Shula, but this is different here. SP is pronounced like it as, as if it were SHP. So let's read some of these. Uh, Spule. Spule. Sport. Sport. And then same thing with ST as if it were written as HT. So Stein. Stein. Staub. Staub. Verstehen. Even in the middle of the le middle of a word where st occurs, it's still pronounced as if it were sht. And we had an example of that in one of the countries. I forget which one. Um, Spanian, for example, instead of Span Spanian, they say Spanian. S H P, etc. Okay. Let's see. Um, okay. Then, then other remarkable uh, differences are th. Is pronounced like, just like a T, so let's read these. Luther, Goethe. Luther, Goethe. Matilda. 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 She's um, in Australia uh, playing. Um, uh, <laughs> what would the, the, the boomerang won't come back, that, that game. It's very famous. Oh. <laughs> and then the V sounds like an F, so feel for larva. Feel. For larva. Even when it occurs in the middle of a word, still is pronounced like as if it were an F. And then V, um, ventil, uh, we've had before a W, remember, sounds like a V. So this is Wein, Welt, Antwort. Everybody? Wein, Welt, Antwort. What do these words mean, Sierra? Uh, wine, world, and answer. Good. Um, okay. And and is this somewhat familiar to you, a vine? <laughs> yeah, it is. You might just mention a couple of things about. Um, well, it's your, it's funny that it's also the name for Vienna as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the city. And so, um, mm. but yeah, I own a vineyard and a winery up here in Northern California. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of experience with vines and wine. And and a lot of those come from uh, where? Which country that you you're mentioning? Um, all of our all of our varietals are originally from Spain, so we we grow Spanish varietals here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm not sure if this is actually related to the town of Vienna, because it's in German it's Wien, V I E N. Um, I mean M W W I E N Wien. So, but mm. but maybe it is. I'm not sure. Then X uh, Axa Hexa. And it said, remember, it has a T-S sound, so this is Zoll. Try that, Zoll. Zoll. Herz. Herz. Arzt. Arzt. Zane. Zane. Zena. 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 Okay, great. And here's some uh, words, then we'll just read some of these for the fun of it. Um, just get the sense of the, vocab uh, the sounds of the words. Konrad Adenauer. Conrad Adenauer. And if you can please, uh, as, as you probably are doing, repeat with Sierra. Justus von Liebig. Justus von Liebig. There's a back with a J and then the IG little guttural. Max Liebermann. Max Liebermann. Martin Luther. Martin Luther. There's a TH, like, it sounds like a T. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Did you love the movie Amadeus, everybody? Yeah, I did, I did, yeah. Rainer Maria Rilke. Rainer Maria Rilke. Really good practice with the R's there. Johann Friedrich Schiller. Johann Friedrich Schiller. Yeah, he was, um, there's a, there's a uh, sort of a denkmal to him in, in Weimar that, that I saw a couple summers ago. Maria Theresia. Maria Theresia. Ferdinand Graf von Zeppelin. Ferdinand Graf von Zeppelin. Albrecht Dürer. Albrecht Dürer. Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant. Arthur Schopenhauer. Arthur Schopenhauer. Good. Uh, Jesus Christus. Jesus Christus. Ulrich von Hutten. 
Ulrich von Houten. How do you think they all did? Uh, I think they did great. Good. Okay. Thank you. You all did. You are are doing great. It's it's uh sounds sounds like you're uh, getting a real uh, sense of the of the sound of the words and the letters. Okay. So now that's the end of the sort of the introduction to the pronunciation of the language, <clears throat> and we're going to go right next to uh, into the um, introduction of the of the of the chapter itself, and we'll come right back.